2022 Small Farms Winter Webinar, Webinar Series hosted by University of Illinois Extension's Local Food Systems and Small Farms team. My name is Bronwyn Ailey, Local Food Systems and Small Farms Educator for Gallatin, Hamilton, Hardin, Pope, Saline, and White Counties, and I will be your moderator for today's session. We, we do really appreciate you joining us for these webinars, and we will do our best to begin and end within the space of your lunch hour. Uh, just so you know, today is the last webinar for the 2022 series um, for, this, for this year. It is difficult to deliver in-depth, actionable information in one hour, so please put your questions in the chat box during the presentation, and we'll do our best to make sure that all of the questions are answered at the end of the presentation. This week's presentation, Growing Great Grapes, is from Grant McCarty. Grant is a local food systems and small farms educator for Joe Davies, Stevenson, and Winnebago counties in Northern Illinois. He works with commercial and non-commercial growers and producers by providing resources and assistance in fruit and vegetable production. Grant's areas of expertise include soils, tree fruit pruning, disease management, and general fruit and vegetable production. He further assists stakeholders with the local food, within the local food system in helping them to expand their operation, adopt new practices, and or better manage their current production. And so with that, i um, really looking forward to hearing what Grant has to say about growing great grapes. And I will turn it back over to you, Grant. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Bradwin. Uh, I turned my video on just briefly so you can see my voice. and and see what I look like. Um, I'm gonna turn it off right now, but I'll turn it back on at the end when we go to questions. Um, so thanks again for being here today, especially as we begin to wrap up our Small Farms Winter Webinar Series. Uh, as someone who's overseen it the last couple of weeks, it's just been a really great opportunity to see and hear from a lot of folks in Extension and other organizations. And so due to requests and due to some of what we saw in our evaluations, we decided to present today on growing great grapes. And this is a topic that I've gotten a lot of demand for, especially in Northern Illinois, where I'm located, where we have a number of vineyards, as well as a number of backyard production for grapes. So what I've tried to do today is really provide an introduction to this topic for those currently growing or those that maybe are looking to get started. I think especially over the last couple of years, people have started to think more about doing side hobbies and growing things in their backyard to see if this could become a very viable business. And that's where I really wanted to try to go with, uh, with today's topic. One thing I would also share is that I am in Northern Illinois and sometimes I speak from a Northern Illinois perspective. And some of the practices that I recommend or timelines that I recommend make sense for Northern Illinois, but gosh, they don't always make sense for Central or Southern Illinois. Um, when we think about pruning, for instance, and the ability to prune or when you can't prune any longer based on weather, or as an example. Um, another thing to, to, to kind of mention with that as well is that I'm entering now my second year of backyard grape production. We've got three varieties that are going to be growing. Um, this is their second year of growing it. So I've got some hands-on experience and a lot of what I really learned is speaking to colleagues and will hopefully as the years go by get much greater grape uh, work in production. So let's get started then. So when we think about grapes, especially as a small fruit, one of the things that I think really sets it apart um, in local food production is that there's a lot of unique and interesting Midwestern varieties. And there's been a wonderful breeding programs that have really created some robust varieties that create some unique varieties for you to grow. So it isn't necessarily that we're having to grow varieties that weren't, um, weren't cultivated in our, our Midwestern area, we really have a lot that were, and they have some unique uh, flavors and, and opportunities with that. If you speak to a lot of grape growers, they tend to be very, find it a very rewarding experience. I think that's really true for a lot of fruit production and vegetable production, but I think there's a whole culture that really surrounds grape production that really speaks to the growth of it and, and how people grow it. This is a crop that we see low water and fertility requirements for. And we won't get into too much detail on that today, but just know that this is a crop that 
he may be able to get away without having as robust of a water or fertility plan in place. We also find that this is one that there's a potential hobby that grows into a business. This is one where putting out some vines and some plants in the backyard could give you that experience to scale up and create some opportunities for you that maybe you didn't think otherwise. One of the other things that folks sometimes ask is, you know, how many plants do I need? And this is one where you could get away with one plant. You could just put one plant in the backyard, one plant in your growing area, see how it performs for you and grow from there. When we compare this to other fruit, such as fruit trees, where sometimes we need more than one variety for cross-pollination, this is one that uh, one is fine. You can grow just one vine. Now let's talk about the challenges, because especially growing fruit in the Midwest, there's always going to be challenges. And with grapes, there are challenges. One of the things that you have to really recognize, especially if you are approaching this from a production business standpoint, is that the Midwestern climate allows for diseases to thrive. This is not a plan. This is not a, a direction to go if you're looking for one that doesn't have disease problems because these plants have disease problems. And it's crucial to manage these diseases in order to get proper yields for where you want to take your grapes next. So recognize that. And we'll talk more about that today, that that disease factor is one thing to really think about as you think about growing grapes. That being said, there can be an expectation of a spray plant and the expectation of using fungicides when growing grapes, especially if you are thinking that you're going to grow grapes on a scale to sell at local vineyards or to sell to wineries, there is going to be an expectation of utilizing fungicides and potentially insecticides in order to get the grapes to the level that they need to be in order to bring to market or to utilize what you plan to do. Um, there's limited cultivars. That's, I think, something to really think about is that we think about, say, apples, for instance, where it's just, my goodness, sometimes hundreds of varieties of apples. When we compare that to grapes, we may be looking at potentially less than 100 varieties out there. And from there, they then break down into different categories as well, which we will talk about today. But just know that sometimes there's limited cultivars with it. This is a crop that needs trellising and it needs pruning in order to thrive, in order to grow. So you need to have that support. You're not going to have your grapes just running <laughs> on the ground. You're going to have them on support in order to grow. We also find that wildlife can be an issue, especially with birds. And for those first couple of years, even deer can be quite a bit of challenge for growing grapes. So you will need to manage your grapes in a way that can keep them from being <laughs> taken out by wildlife. And finally, as we think about an acre, or we think about uh, just what our production scale might look like, sometimes the inputs can be expensive. You know, especially as you think about that this is something that's gonna require a spray program. These are crops that may require more labor than, than you're used to. It's something to really recognize. And there'll be resources at the end against some of the business side of it and some of the budgets. So here's an image I, I drew for you that goes into some of the different parts of the grape plant. And I bring this up early on because I will tend to reiterate some of this as we go along today. And so I want you to have it so that you can kind of understand what we're really talking about here. In this drawing, this is almost all pieces of what a grape plant would be, the grape structure. Um, the cordon is a semi-permanent extension of your trunk. And so you can kind of see, I'm gonna use my, my mouse here for a second. Uh, the cordon is what we, what we kind of see here where the spurs are located. So the cordon is semi-permanent. Uh, depending on how you grow your grapes, you may have a cordon develop. We'll talk about that again as we go along today. From the cordon or from the actual canes, you may have spurs. These are shoots, these are canes that will develop from them. Or your canes, this will be your mature shoot. It's those that become woody after growth has really ceased. And when we think about pruning in the winter time or setting up our trellis, we're really talking about getting our canes in shape because there's always that renewal of canes that is happening every year. 
Your shoots are immature, they're young, they've developed that growing season. They tend to be very soft stem growths that yet again happen from, from that main growing season itself. Um, there's other terminology on here as well that if you're familiar with fruit trees, such as a graft union, water sprout, suckers, those are very common in growing uh, our, our fruit trees. When we talk about grapes, we really have to approach it from two different directions. So think of this as, as a fork in the road, really. If you are growing grapes now, or if you're going to grow grapes in the future, you really have two directions. You have what's called a cordon spur approach, where you are trellising your grapes in a way in which you will develop a cordon. And it will be this semi-permanent seven to 10 year old extension of the trunk from which your grapes will develop from the spurs. This is a very common approach to wine grapes. And this is a recommended approach with wine grapes. On the right side, you see what we are probably traditionally familiar with. A, the traditional cane approach where I have my trunk, my trunk is extending to a certain height on the trellis that I have in mind. And then every season I'm selecting canes, usually two to four, sometimes that's kind of where we see is, is two to four canes are selected. Off of those canes, they're then trellised. And then from there, that's where my grapes are, are coming from. Um, we see traditional cane approach as one that works really well for table grapes, which we will talk about today yet again. Um, you could do wine grapes on the traditional cane approach. You could do table grapes on the cord and spur approach. But what I want to get across to you is that this decision, this fork in the road, is something that you have to really accept because based on whether cordon or spur or based on traditional cane, that will then dictate your trellising, your training, and really how you're pruning these grapes and the success of these grapes. And yet again, wine grapes is better for cord and spurs. Traditional cane is better for, for table grapes. So choosing these cultivars then. Next, we've decided we've got a fork in the road. Now let's actually talk about the next decision. And that is, are you growing table grapes or are you growing wine grapes? A table grape is fresh eating. It is one that I am making into juices, jams, jellies. I'm bringing indoors. I mean, just you know, right off of the vine, if you will, uh, for my family. Uh, Concord. Concord is a table grape. Then you have your wine grapes, the other option. The wine grape is that this is a variety, a cultivar that is, that is really designed for wine cultivation. It's really designed for different types of wines. And we don't see too much crossover. We really see that this is a grape that's table or this is a grape that is wine. And many of the new cultivars that might be emerging over the next couple of years from some of our, our uh, uh, grape breeding programs are broken down into either one of these categories too. I would also state that if you're thinking about new grapes, look at your long-term goals here. So if it is that I want it to sell to a vineyard or I want to um, grow them to make my own wine at home, then you're choosing wine grapes. Um, if you're thinking that this is gonna be a product for value added, for jams, jellies, for anything else out there, then that would be your table grape approach. And that would be what you are after with it too. Um, the next, Things to consider would be disease resistance and disease susceptibility. What are the susceptibility of these cultivars to certain diseases? And we'll talk more about that today as well. We also would encourage winter hardiness, especially how far north I am. I always encourage the hardest winter hardiness that you can get. You might also consider less vigor, especially if you are factoring in that you are gonna be the one pruning your grapes you're gonna be the one harvesting your grapes, you're gonna be the main manager of your grapes, perhaps you then decide that you're going to um, choose a variety that doesn't have as much vigor to it. You might also consider, consider early yielding. That sometimes is an approach that some folks have in. At University of Illinois Extension, we always recommend ordering from a reputable nursery or greenhouse. There's numerous ones out there. We don't recommend ones over the other. But just know, depending on your scale and depending on how many plants you may need, you may find that there are ones that may work better for you compared to others. How many plants? We get this question so many times of like, well, how many plants do I really need? 
on average, depending on how you trellis, depending on how you are pruning, depending on a perfect season for that growth of the grape plant, you should expect 10 to 12 pounds of grapes after year three. Year three tends to be the year that you enter maturity of that grape plant. These grape plants live upwards of 30 years, and this is also when these are spaced six to eight feet between trunks. I would further lean more towards an eight foot spacing between your trunks. That would be what I would encourage more than the six feet. And we'll, you'll see more of this today as we go along. But if I was thinking of growing grapes for a vegetable CSA or selling at a farmer's market, that is probably gonna mean that I need much more grapes than just one plant. If I'm showing up to a farmer's market with just 10 pounds of grapes, that's not a lot of grapes. So we'll get further into these different distinctions. Uh, we have wine grapes, and yet again, okay, you've decided on wine grapes, and your next decision is, is it gonna be red or is it gonna be a, a white? You know, that's really what you're aiming for is that a wine grape is going to be grown for red wine or it's gonna be grown for white wine. Um, there can be some crossover, so let me be clear, there can sometimes be a little bit of crossover here and there, but really you see one direction or the other. The second decision, especially if you're really into viticulture and you're really into wine making or wanting to sell to wineries, is the type of wine. They can be broken down and say that this is a good Merlot, this is a uh, good Rosé. A lot of the detail into wine grapes gets really into that. It can also stress the flavors, the notes that you should expect from it. There's a number of great Minnesota hardy types available, and that is where a lot of the uh, cultivars that are recommended are coming from is they've been specifically bred in that cold climate and they have a lot of great uh, production because of that. I've listed some examples uh, for you here. Uh, Frontenac, for instance, the blue grape, it's used commonly in red wine. Uh, Itasca is a new release from the last couple of years. It is one that's white. It's also very good for a, a dry, a wine. And then Marquette is another one that gets mentioned quite often. It's bold. It's a red, uh, a red wine for uh, red for, for table wine. So just a general table wine. It's what they would recommend. My other group then, my table grapes, this is our value added. So it's jams, it's jellies, it's fresh eating. These would probably be a great introduction to farmers markets, into vegetable CSAs, into kind of anything that's a direct market, you would probably find some pretty good success with your table grapes. The challenge with this one is that sometimes you don't have as many cultivars available as so much of the breeding of grapes tends to focus a bit more on wine grapes than it does on our, our table grapes. You may also find that there's a lot more seeded cultivars um, available, which are also more winter hardy. Um, though it should be stressed that the seedless types do exist uh, and you should recognize that. For instance, Somerset, which is listed here, is a seedless uh, table grape. It also has a really good, like high quality is how they describe it. A lot of our table grapes are also very susceptible to diseases. So just recognize that, that you know, this is a group that when they grow, they can grow very well, but you may have some disease problems that you really need to, to address. Um, Concord is one that is still recommended well for Midwest. And we think about that traditional uh, Concord grape. Concord would do fine for you as a table grape uh, with it. But of course, do a little more research. One of the best publications out there, and I cannot stress this enough when it comes to growing grapes, is this a review of cold climate grape cultivars from Iowa State. This was published in 2016. It goes through over 70 different cultivars in this publication. And I downloaded it for you and I've placed it in our box folder for you to access. And this would be a great place to start when you think about what types of grapes you're going to grow. Um, this is taken from that publication. This is uh, Aldine. And you can see that within this publication, it goes into some general commentary of where it comes from, 
But the thing I really want you to look at is the berry description and telling you kind of what the colors will be and look like. You also see a viticulture characteristics. What does the vine like? What's its habit? Um, and then look at disease and pests. You know, so you can see with Aldean, it's moderately susceptible to botrytis bunch rot and powdery mildew. It could be slightly susceptible to downy mildew. Um, and it can further be a little bit sensitive to injuries from sulfur, or rather it's not sensitive to injuries from sulfur application. Sulfur being one of our organic fungicides that you might be looking to use. You'll also see that it will tell you whether it's a wine grape or it's a table grape. It may tell you whether it's an early season yielding. And then look, you've got cold hardiness. You can see this is moderately hardy, negative 10 to negative 20. Because of that distinction, I would probably not even grow it in Northern Illinois because we do have some years that are much, much colder than that. But this might be a great candidate for Central. It could also be a good candidate for Southern Illinois too. But certainly look at this place, this, this resource, because this is gonna be a great place to really get started into figuring out your varieties of what to grow and, and really what to avoid. And especially if you're thinking about wine grapes, this goes into a lot of description about the flavors, the qualities, and even some of the descriptions of what wines could be, could be used for it. So I've hinted at this. You see I have bolded this information as well. You should absolutely consider disease resistance and susceptibility for the grape varieties that you are growing. When it comes to this fruit, it is one that can be very hard to manage. And for many of these disease problems, you need to be spraying and putting good practices in place before disease has even shown up. One of the other things to, to mention you know, here, you can see is we kind of have big, the big four. We have black rot, powdery mildew, downy mildew, botrytis. There's also phomopsis. There's a number of other grape diseases that are out there that can really have a huge impact on your grape growing success or the grape growing experience. I think it's especially important if you're going to be growing grapes, say just on a large arbor, and you have this image of I want a beautiful arbor covered in grapevines, you probably want to choose one that has a lot of disease resistance because it's not going to look pretty when it's covered in disease, or it's going to be difficult for you to spray if there is disease pressure that you know you have to manage for. So recognize that this is just something you really need to consider. And you will find that some are not fully resistant. Um, you know, for instance, we think about something like Marquette, which you see here, has some resistance to a couple of diseases, but it's highly susceptible to phomopsis. Or you even see Atasca here. Atasca is very resistant to downy and powdery mildew, but there's some slight susceptibility to black rot. So every different cultivar you choose may have a range of having some resistance every once in a while to a disease, but it could also have susceptibility to others. And it's just one part of your disease management practice that we really encourage you to, to, to put in place. So I hope I haven't scared you too much about growing grapes, but that's information that I think is really important as you think about growing them or as you currently grow them. So let's just think about location. You've decided you're going to grow grapes and you're looking for a good location for it. Grapes thrive in full sun. We really don't want to place them in partial shade. We really want to ensure that they are getting as much sunlight as possible because that's really going to ensure that you're going to have grapes that growing season. Realistically, this also tends to be a north to south direction. As you think about your vines and think about the location of them, a north to south direction really serves them well to get that full sun that they really need for that growing season. We also want to focus on good water drainage. So this is not going to be a crop that tolerates any kind of flooded type of conditions. It's going to thrive on good water drainage. It also would be one that would do great in what's called a medium textured soil. This is a soil that's about almost like flour, if you will, like a baking flour. It's very similar to that. It also tends to be a soil that has low sand or really low clay as well. You want to aim for a pH between 6 to 6.5, although it has the ability to, to be okay with things that are a little bit more alkaline, a little bit higher, higher than the sevens. 
And then furthermore, avoid frost pockets because that can just lead to, to more issues in growing the plants. You would wanna avoid any heavy, any very, very clay soils, any ponding. And then also consider not placing these near wooded areas. And this is because we're trying to keep birds, deer, and other wildlife from getting to these grapes before you can get to these grapes. So placement can be very crucial here. So I tend to think about when I have an introduction course or we talk about introducing things of what does day one look like? And this is what you see here. We've ordered our plants, they're coming in and we're going to plant them. So yet again, about six to eight feet apart between plants, so trunk to trunk. I would lean a little heavier on that eight feet because I think it makes sense for the trellising that we're going to be doing. We want to keep the vines in buckets of water. We also want to prune back those roots some. We don't need as big of a mass there. And then we don't recommend fertilizers that first season. So don't get a fertilizer just yet. We're just not there yet. Um, at planting, we want to prune to one shoot and about three buds. In that first season, so at planting and say that summertime, we're going to see a lot of growth. It's going to get pretty wild and you're going to be very surprised by that. And then as you look to the next year, when you go into that second year, that spring, almost all the pruning is a removal of every single cane and you're getting back to just one cane because we need a trunk. We need to establish that trunk the first couple of years. And depending on the structure that you have chosen the trellis on, it could be that your trunk needs to be much longer, much higher rather, much taller, or it could be that, okay, the trunk is just gonna get four or five feet. And then from there, our canes will extend from it. So it will really get back to the structure you have in place and what you're really after. But just know that that first season, we're not after any great production. We're really after getting trunk establishment. You may see some grapes actually emerge on the plant that growing season. And I would recommend removing that because we need to make sure that the energy is going to that trunk to get well established. So training and trellising, really these words kind of go hand in hand when we think about it. But with that training aspect, we're trying to position my grapes to allow for yields, airflow, and good growth. There's multiple trellising systems that are designed, but most can really adapt to the structure. So however you are deciding to grow your grapes, whether on a commercial scale, whether on just you wanna grow them in the backyard and see how they do, think about your structure and, and kind of go from there. When you look through some of the literature and some of the resources and guides I've made available to you, most of them will mention a four and six cane niffin, which is, is what you really see here, where we have um, two rows of our canes and we have the first row at three feet, the second row is at six feet. And so the top of my trunk is really going to be uh, a little over six feet. And then I have two canes on either side that are then trellised with it. Um, if you were doing it on an arbor or another, then we might train it a little differently. We might need to grow it in a different way in order to really get what you're after there, which may not be as much production, but maybe more of just the actual beauty of the grapevine, more for cosmetic purposes. So you can see here, if we think about a traditional cane approach for the four cane Neffen design, um, four canes are selected and they're produced from the center trunk. And then two lines are at three feet each. And then new canes are selected every year. And so what that means is that you see these one-year-old canes, these are canes that maybe I selected in 2022. They would yield my, um, my grapes for me in the summer of 2022. And then in the early winter of 2023, I would be selecting new canes that are coming from the renewal spurs. So it's a continual um, movement of new canes emerging, being selected, and then new canes coming in the next year. And we'll get more into this into pruning as we go along today as well. But this design, this system may help with this, allowing for spread, spread of the, 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 uh, the grape plant too. But yet again, it's back to my trunk. 
and how tall my trunk needs to be for the trellis I have in place. The bilateral cordon, so yet again, we think about our fork in the road, the bilateral cordon, more appropriate for wine grapes. Um, this is that semi-permanent extension that is from my trunk. And you can see on this design too that we have, um, there are eight feet between my grape plants. And so we have four feet of the cordon going one way, four feet of the cordon going the other way per each of these plants. And so it's gonna be semi-permanent, it's gonna live for seven to 10 years, and then the canes will come from the spurs on that cordon selected to produce fruit. So very much that if I'm thinking about training, if I'm thinking about trellising, I would already have these structures in mind so that my cane or rather my trunk would reach the right height in order for this to, come, to, to grow. Um, you kind of see that the top line of this, this structure is gonna be about five and a half feet. It is really um, what we're after here. So five and a half feet, we've got, you know, in the middle here of my trunk, four feet this way, four feet that way. My next great plant, four feet the opposite direction. And then realistically, eight feet between. But if you had something different, if you had a different kind of design in mind, such as an arb or a fan design, um, this will be adapting the grapevine into that set structure. So if you have eight feet of, of structure that you're trying to get to, it may be that you actually are extending that trunk and encouraging that trunk to reach the top of eight feet. And then from there, you're selecting canes every year to, to be a part of it. So there's ability, especially with grapes, to adapt. Um, and I think that that's going to come back to what your long-term goals are. If you are thinking that you want to grow them for a production standpoint and to produce for farmers markets, for vineyards and so forth, um, or this system is not necessarily gonna work well for you because the structure is just not really designed in place. And especially if you think about spraying these for diseases, it can be a little complicated, uh, especially with a structure like this. Um, but certainly they can work. You just would focus on creating a, a long trunk with a cane extension. And probably you would not be doing this in a, a cordon design. So the trellising then, which gets, yes, again, kind of gets back to that training then. Um, you don't really see, especially at planting, that any sort of trellising is needed just yet. But into that first growing season, you may need to put maybe a semi-temporary trellising in place. If you're not ready yet to have your trellising structure up, a temporary one would be suitable for that growing first year because all you're trying to do is get canes developed and then from there select the, the trunk and where it's gonna be. Regarding where that first line should be, where should that first kind of line be for grapes? It's gonna depend on your structure and it's really gonna depend on your plant. Um, one line could be 60 to 66 inches. This is five to five and a half feet. Two lines could be at 36 inches at three feet. And then a second line at 72 inches at six feet. Yet again, it can get back to really what you're after and what your purpose is. If we think about a cordon and we're gonna grow on a cordon structure, then it would be at five and a half feet and five to five and a half feet would be where that first line is. You compare that to um, having four canes selected every year for table grapes, then we would probably have two lines. Could you do a cordon or a trunk with, with canes? But that's really the question that it comes down to. So you can see kind of back to that first image you saw, the cordon spur approach or the traditional cane approach. Um, for the cordon, we're probably gonna put that first gray line, which you see here at 60 to 66 inches. You could probably go a little bit lower than that. Some of the great plants that we have will be cordon and they're right at about a little less than five feet is where, where I'm kind of stopping it to then have my cordon extend. So it would really get back to really what you're after versus say a table grape, which you see here on the left or rather the right, which is our traditional cane approach. Um, 
while I did this drawing, I would further say that it, this trunk would need to go further so that then I would have a cane selected every year here, a cane selected every year, year here, and so forth. I could tie these two canes together against the structure here and have that be a little bit tighter. Um, or my first couple of years could really be, you know, focusing on that. So yet again, I mean, if you have a structure that is, you know, five feet tall and you want to do cane, uh, cane approach, um, then that would be certainly fine to extend that, that trunk up much further. So putting it up at that first line and then having your cane from it. I, I share this because it's really up to how, what structure you're choosing uh, and what you really want to do with it. Um, there are some guides out there that get trellising and more trellising type structures, especially if you're going to be doing it on a production vineyard row scale. I've listed some information here. There's a great guide from New Mexico that shows some of these diagrams about the end posts, uh, as well as where the line posts need to be um, as you go through with this. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on it just for, for time's sake, but I would stress that there's a lot of different designs out there that can really help you get your trellising figured out and really help you when it comes to your spacing for, for your grapes. You'll note that most of the time when we are talking about trellising and setting up rows of grapes, we are finding that you're gonna to need to have support on the end of these grape, uh, grape rows, which yet again would be a cost you have to kind of factor in. Um, to show you kind of two things to think about, especially maybe untraditional things that we might be growing our grapes on, you can see over here on the left, this is just an overhead drawing of uh, NIDA from Texas A&M. So realistically, they have three cordons that are placed on this structure. And yet again, we're viewing it from above. So we're viewing it down. And you can see they've got three cordons and these cordons are all spaced um, about four feet between. So this is potentially just one grape plant. Uh, there's three grape plants for my cursor. So a grape plant here, a grape plant here, and then a grape plant here. And then they are extending that trunk all the way up to the top of that arbor. And then they are running a permanent or semi-permanent cordon off of that. So then they would probably have to get a ladder and stand up on that ladder and prune the cordon back, which we'll talk about later today. Um, so it can be done. You know, you think about your structure and, and what you're really after. On the opposite side here, you see this traditional cane approach where, all right, I've got a, an arbor or a structure that's maybe six, seven feet tall. I, in my head, maybe my design is going to be, I'm going to have that trunk touch the top of that arbor. And then every single year, I will come in and select canes and then tie my canes down in which the grapes will cascade down from there. Um, this may work for you. It may be possible for you. Yet again, how are you gonna spray this if disease is a problem, if disease is an issue here? Grapes are ones that need to be pruned. So don't think that we're talking about a crop that doesn't need to prune. In fact, sometimes when we're pruning, we're removing almost 90% of the growth, which seems excessive. And yet this is something that you really have to do. Um, we do this for reasons for plant health, for fruit load balance, for disease management, and really just for renewal of vines. If you want grapes year after year, you need to prune. If you don't prune, there's, you're not gonna get grapes. That's really what a lot of it comes down to. Realistically, we see this about late winter into early spring. In Northern Illinois, we still have some ability to do this um, the first couple of weeks of March. You probably don't have that luxury in other parts of the state because of, of the weather really increasing um, in, in moving out of dormancy. But we do see this quite often, um, that late winter focus is what you're after. Like we saw earlier, the cane spur approach or the traditional um, the cordon spur approach or the traditional cane approach, this is similar. Cane or spur pruning is what you're really after here. Um, the cane pruning you see here where in this photo from Oregon State, they've selected canes, 
four canes every year. They've pruned out all the rest, and then they're going to trellis them. The spur pruning, which we'll go into more detail as we, as we go along, it would be your other option. It would be more accustomed to wine production or wine grapes, rather. You could go back and forth, but we really don't recommend it. We would recommend that you stick to your guns and really stick to either cane pruning or spur pruning. Furthermore, it can get complicated. I'm barely telling you about pruning today. I'm just kind of introducing this so that you can do some more research on your own. But it can get more complicated, especially as you look towards wine production, wine grape production. So which pruning method then? It really depends on how your vines are currently growing. You know, if you have set them up in a way that is for cane encouragement versus spur encouragement, that would be the direction to go. If it's new plants, then you can decide. But yet again, that's really back to what the training and trellising is those first couple of years. For spur pruning, this is more common on wine grapes, more common on commercial scale. That cordon is developed, which you see here in this photo from extension. It is one that folks tend to gravitate towards from a labor standpoint. It can be a little bit more reduced or easy to do, um, but it would depend highly on how your grapes are being trained. The cane pruning, this is a little bit more on small scale arbors, maybe even what we call, call a standard trellising. It also tends to be much better for table grapes. There is additional pruning that is sometimes encouraged, especially for wine grapes called shoot thinning. And this is just something where you may be removing additional growth that seasons to allow for good airflow and to allow for more light penetration. Um, I think there's a resource that I gave you that gets into to this. And yet again, this is a topic that needs its own hour or two to really go into more detail. And as you get started, this will also be a good place to, to reach out to folks to see if you get hands-on experience too. So uh, cane pruning, um, you know, you're, each spring you're, you're selecting two to four canes per plant. It's back to your trellising, what type of trellising structure you have in place. And then you are selecting canes based on the number of buds per cane. So wine grapes tend to have less buds on a single grape plant which is about 20 to 30 buds per plant. For table grapes, we can get more than that, 50 to 80 buds per plant. So that's what you're really after uh, uh, with this. You would also leave renewal spurs, and you saw an image of that previously of what that looked like. And then all other growth is removed. So you look at my image that I drew for you where it's just all these different canes on this grape plant, and yet we're just selecting four from it based on the structure that we have in place. What's a good cane? How do we describe a good cane? It's cinnamon brown in color. It tends to be slightly larger in pencil diameter. And we also tend to see it's about three to five feet long. Now, it doesn't mean we're gonna keep it at five feet, but we would count the buds. And then we would determine how many buds we needed based on, our on, on, our, um, on whether it's table or wine. Uh, for spur pruning, yet again, we're back to our cordon. We have six to seven spurs per cordon direction. So both the right and the left, if you will, they're spaced about a fist distance uh, with it. And then we cut back to one cane per spur with one to two buds. This can be a little bit quicker once that cordon is established. And we will need to replace this cordon after seven to 10 years, which is basically another cane. Uh, this is a new drawing. I just did this drawing a couple hours ago because I wasn't comfortable with the drawing I gave you in the handout. So just know that this is a brand new drawing that's not the same in your handouts. But you can see that from every kind of spur, we're selecting one single cane. We're cutting that cane down to one to two buds. Um, and then we're eliminating another cane. So every spur gets one cane. And from that cane, there's one to two, two buds. And effectively, this is leading us to about, to, to almost between 14 to uh, 28 uh, grape buds uh, on our grape plant, which is why this is much better for wine grapes. So disease management, just quickly, um, you know, we reiterated perfect disease conditions. And just 
I think a lot of times expect one disease and expect more than one disease in that growing season. Recognize your food expectations. If you're selling, recognize their expectations too. There's a lot of good practices to do in place that we've talked about disease resistance, we've talked about recognizing susceptibility. I think site selection is also helpful. Having good airflow can reduce disease severity. Having good pruning and trellising can also reduce disease severity. Use bird netting, bird damage can lead to disease problems, uh, open that plant up to disease problems. There's also fungicides available and would be ones we would recommend you just keep in mind to know as an option. Uh, this is a photo of black rot. So you can see there that it can really be a pretty disruptive disease. Some of these really can. Regarding wildlife, especially those first couple of years, look to grow tubes for deer protection. It's not perfect, but it could be a route to really grow, go in order to really uh, to help with that management. We would also say a soap deterrent, sometimes Irish spring can work okay with this. Sometimes hot pepper spray, but we would recommend that on a small scale, it could be used, but would also state that some of the hot pepper spray is not labeled for food production. Birds, the best recommendation is netting. And you see this often, and it gets back to your trellising and how you're doing it. Three fourths of an inch is at least what you're after here. Previously, chemical repellents, such as a grape Kool Aid deterrent that would be sprayed on the grapes, was recommended. There's been some research that it's just not effective anymore for this, but expect a combination of it. You can see in this photo here the canopy underneath it where grapes have been damaged by birds. You open it up to disease problems. Uh, as far as harvest, you know, color, particular cultivar, stem supporting the cluster that changes from green to brown. The seeds can be darkened and mature. Sometimes on a small scale, a taste test at the tip of the cluster can give this away. I recognize that some of this information is very generic. Some of this is very scientific and some of this is very anecdotal, maybe based on what you're, <laughs> what you know. If you're doing wine grapes, know that the tests go further. You're looking at sugar content. You're looking at other qualities of that, of that wine grape in order to determine your harvest. So uh, we're getting wrapped up today. Just want to uh, reiterate the resources um, that are available to you. I do have a longer webinar version of today, and it can be found at go.illinois.edu slash grapes 2021. That will take you to a YouTube page and has a much longer presentation of today's webinar. Um, handouts and resources, including all of the links below, can be found in the go.illinois.edu slash grape handouts. There's a wonderful grapes extension guide, grapes.extension.org, that has a number of great production practices. But I've got a whole category on trellising, pruning, and training, and I would encourage you to look more in depth on that, especially two of the YouTube videos from Oregon State that are just fantastic about showing spur pruning and cane pruning. So as we get wrapped up today, you know, think about the cultivars wisely. Think about disease resistance. Consider what your long-term goals are going to be. And then train, trellis, and prune effectively. And you may take, have some years that it gets, it may take some years to get used to it and understand what you need to do. And grapes are, are ones that can be forgiving. They can be pretty forgiving if you sometimes have four years, but having those good practices in place, learning those skills can ensure that you have a wonderful grape growing experience. We didn't get too much into insects today, but certainly wanna manage those, look at disease management and the bird and wildlife management. And then finally, try to enjoy some grapes. I hope I haven't scared you too much <laughs> in growing these. So that's my email. That's my phone number. Um, I'd be more than happy to take questions. I'm going to also launch our demographic poll. So uh, would appreciate you filling this out. Yet again, it's completely voluntary, but it is something that really helps us out with, with our, our webinar series. Uh, so Bronwyn, I am I'm open for some questions. Okay, Grant, um, looking over the questions here and you know you, you had mentioned and recommended um, 
to everyone to to check out those webinars or uh, and YouTube videos on uh, more in depth on the pruning and training systems. Um, but we did have a couple of questions that are a little bit more general and not exactly specific on on the on the pruning or training techniques. A um, couple of questions here. In comparing the two training systems that you've talked about today, the cordon spur or the traditional, um, which training system requires more labor? I would say that um, this, the, it's going to get back to what your scale is going to be. You know, if you are going to put out an acre of grapes, for instance, the the cane pruning in most cases is going to require more labor because it's going to require multiple people to go through and select the right canes and then do an additional step of trellising compared to spur pruning where I could go through and I could do it pretty quickly down a row. If I was doing it on a smaller scale on a backyard with just some grapes, I would probably lean towards cane pruning because that's just going to be a little bit of a better experience if you're just getting started with this. And it wouldn't be as much labor in, in that regard. Okay, and then I guess to follow up, um, which of the methods uh, do you think produces the most grapes as, as far as you know, volume in pounds? Yeah, so, um, so cane pruning is going to be will produce more table grapes. You're going to get more table grapes from the cane pruning or the cane traditional cane approach. You will get more wine grapes from the cordon approach. So that would be your distinction with them. They can do both. You can do both, but just know that the wine grapes will produce more on a cordon approach compared to the cane approach. And cane is better for table. And would that be the main reason why we, is that the main reason why you are recommending that the cordon spur system is better for the wine grapes because it is more productive? It, it is. And, you know, especially when you start to get, when you get into a scale where you're trying to really look at some of the, the budgets, the budgets tend to be rooted in the cordon approach. And so that, that's why we tend to recommend that. If you also have, you also have to recognize, I think when you start to scale up that a spray fungicide program is going to be expected and the cordon approach is gonna allow for that. Um, it's, it's gonna be an easier, you're gonna have an easier ability to spray your grapes with a cordon approach than a cane approach. Okay. Um, then we also had a couple of questions um, around um, mulching and so is mulching recommended or not and and if it is are there different materials that can be used for mulching i would try to keep this as weed free uh, as possible um especially if you were on a scale um you know on an, a half acre or an acre or more i would try to keep it as weed free as possible um and so i wouldn't use a mulch the reason for not necessarily using a mulch would be that um, the, the mulches tend to bring in wildlife. So overwintering, sometimes you can have wildlife damage to the actual uh, trunk of the grape. Um, in that regard, though, if you were to do some kind of mulch, there has been some research of, of uh, using wood chips before. Uh, some folks have even tried doing cover crops in the middle of them even, and had some success with that. I think you have to factor in the age of your grape plants when you start going down that route. And so for the first three or four years, I would probably try to keep it as weed free as possible. And then if you wanted to potentially do something next, if you wanted to have a mulch layer or, or something, then you might move, um, you might do some further research, but get, get the trunk established, get the plant established. Okay. Um, we'll kind of switch gears a little bit. Um, it was a question about if you were, uh, if you were buying bare root um, planting stock, should you, show, should you soak the, those first before planting? And if so, is it just in water or do you add something else to the water? 
Yeah, so I would soak the bare roots in some water for a, for a little bit of time. Um, you know, it's you don't need to do it in anything else. Um, it's always a general practice, I, I think, of that if you're going to do any kind of planting, you know, turn some compost into that growing area uh, just to kind of get things going. But there wouldn't be any liquid for them to soak in or anything outside of the water. Okay. And then another question, have you ever tried to root cuttings uh, using rooting hormone to replicate a really good variety that's maybe not readily available at a nursery? Yeah, I haven't seen much on that. Um, I think that that could be an option, just depending on, you know, what you have the ability to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it probably would, would be kind of true to type, if you will. Um, but we, we don't see it too often. I think, you know, it would just kind of be up to you. And as, as the person brings up, some of these varieties are in high demand. So I, I can certainly understand that too. Um, I guess in the question, a um, couple questions about timing. Um, when would be the best time to plant your grapes? And also thinking about timing, uh, where we at, where we are currently at, uh, this time of year, uh, is it is it too late to prune? Do any pruning? Yeah, so planting for is um, planting. You're looking at the next probably six weeks would be a great time to plant. So I mean, a spring planting of these would would work well. Um, I did a spring planting last year of, of our backyard grapes, and they they really took off. It took a while. Let me be clear. Like it, some of these can take you think you've bought a dead twig, it's taken a couple months for them to really get some growth and get that warm soil developed. Um, but certainly the next two months, you could plant these pretty well. Um, you know, the second question about the pruning, um, you know, this is one that would be a little bit better for dormancy still, um, I, I think would be something to really consider. And uh, it may be a little bit too late for for us in central and southern Illinois. Um, you know, it's right, we're right on that edge right now uh, of pruning them. Um, I would still think you might be able to get away with it, but I would still be a little bit cautious of it. Um, okay. Um, and now I think we've had, we had a couple of questions um, related to disease management. Uh, one of the questions was, can plants recover from black rot? Yeah, I mean, it's, I would say that, you know, if black rot shows up that season, first off, we have to recognize that a lot of times when a fungicide needs to be applied, it is when there is barely any, any noticeable damage or that you have done a pre-application uh, pre with it. Um, from there, if the black rot is pretty severe, I would probably uh, remediate it during that growing season. I would not expect for the plant necessarily to bounce back. And especially as it moves to your fruit, that's then a, a bigger problem. Um, it can be really challenging to even get, you know, great fruit from that. Um, so just as a general disease management uh, approach, we tend to, you know, try to be preventative as much as we can, but also recognize if something's too far gone. And, you know, one disease causes damage and that leads to other diseases potentially moving in that season. Okay. And then uh, kind of another question related to disease management. Are there, do you know of any other crops or plants that, that can be grown between the rows uh, to be in an end host for some of the diseases to help decrease it from spreading? Oh, that is a, that's a good question. Um, you know, grapes do have powdery and downy mildew. And, but I would stress that both powdery and downy mildew are probably not the same uh, race or kind of variety uh, of, of those. So I would doubt there would be any kind of crossover be between them. Um, we don't really see too much as far as like a, 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 a sacrificial trap crop, if you will, for disease pressure. We see it sometimes for insects, but we really don't see it a lot for, for disease. Um, I would also say that, you know, one of the things to, we're trying to reduce disease severity on 
is by having good airflow between those rows. And if there was a plant that was in between my rows of grapes, I might be concerned that that might impact my, my airflow and that might really limit the ability for my plant leaves to, to dry out. So that would be my cautious uh, statement there is that, so in fact, we don't really see that and then maybe be a little cautious of that as well. And then do the, do the trunks harbor disease like black rot year to year or just the canes? Um, we mostly see it in the canes. I mean, I, I think what you will find is that when we are discussing a fungicide uh, treatment or you know any kind of thing like that, some of them will occasionally expect you to spray the trunks as well to reduce the disease severity. Um, but usually it's the canes where it may be overwintering um, between seasons. And it depends on the disease too. Because the second part of that question would be, uh, would they need to replace the whole plant in severe cases? You don't see that too often. Um, you know, I, I, I think you rarely see that as a recommendation of a full cane removal. I think a lot of it is that, you know, managing the canes, managing any of the debris that's on the ground between seasons um, would be what you'd want to look at after. Um, then there was uh, another question. Um, do you know, are there any folks that are looking at using like a dedicated greenhouse or maybe a high tunnel for grapes? Um, where you, you know, you're controlling the water, um, we've got fans going to move air, but, you know, if it's under protected culture or protected cover, then, you know, are, are we able to maybe reduce some of the, 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 the disease? disease pressure in that planting? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I know that some, um, you know, there, there has been some studies that have looked at growing other fruits under a modified high tunnels. So it's not like a fully enclosed high tunnel, but it's one that allows for some, some protection, if you will, from the conditions. And I think in that system, if you were to put grapes in it, it could allow for getting that airflow that you need. Um, but I also think that most of the recommendations out there and the research is still going towards field production. So it's still going that route of growing them in the field and growing varieties that have disease resistance um, and then managing things in other ways to do it. I think it could be done, but I think the person's right. That humidity question and airflow uh, is, is a big piece to really think about. Yep. Um, the, I guess there wasn't the, you didn't mention much about um, fertility on these, but we had a question about um, could, could we top off uh, the plant uh, each spring? Could we put some compost around the trunk each spring? Um, would that help with, would that be enough did it, uh, fertilizer and help with any soil amendments? Yeah, I would start with the compost, um, you know, especially as we think about a 30 year plant. Um, you know, there are some fertility plans out there, but I think one of the, the benefits to the Midwest is that we have some really great soils in most cases. Um, so the fertility plans aren't always applicable because we have some very robust uh, soil uh, with that. Um, at the same time, you know, if they were growing grapes and in that summer they noticed kind of discoloration in, of, of green or anything like that, it would probably be something where you might want to step in and do a, a plant tissue analysis to see if you need to, to, to take it further and have a fertility plan in place. Okay. Um... I, I think uh, you have answered most of the questions. There were several questions that um, I was able to try to answer in the chat as we were going along. Uh, I one, I guess one more question that just floated in. Um, uh, this person associates growing grapes in a chalky reddish soil. Mm. How, do, how do they grow differently in high organic matter soils? Um, like we, we can see here, and especially in central 
central and maybe even northern Illinois. Yeah, I, yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. You know, we, what we think about with our grape imagery is is this versus another. I think that some of uh, the, the yields are probably pretty similar. I don't think we're really going to see much there. But I would stress that some of these newer, newer in quotes cultivars that we are accustomed to as a Midwestern variety um, are maybe performing a little bit more robust because they have been grown in this midwestern climate and this western soil that being said you know as we think about california grapes or grapes in parts of europe the flavor notes can be very can be vastly different and i think that that is sometimes part of the challenge is that especially if you're thinking of growing them in the vineyard or wanting to get that a flavor of a wine you tasted in europe with european grapes um, you may not find it because the uh, it's a little bit above my pay grade, but I would say like, you know, we think about the notes of wine grapes and certainly the Midwestern soils are probably impacting the notes and the flavor of grapes, just as that chalky um, reddish clay soil is impacting the grapes growing in that. So I think there can be a lot said to that that makes it uh, a little more unique and may also open up opportunities for you but may not give you that true experience that you expect because our climate, our soil, our growing area is potentially imparting some of those flavor notes. Okay, I see, uh, we'll do this one last question and then I think that should wrap us up. Uh, the last question was, are grapes easy to transplant? Um, if you're digging them up and then moving to another area, it might work okay for you, but I would say that if you were doing that, you might want to almost start back at square one where, okay, I've transplanted this great plant over and we're going to create a new trunk. So maybe you create a new cane, perhaps that's now going to be your, your trunk. Um, it will take some experimenting more than anything um, with it. Okay, well, I think that rounds up, rounds out the, the questions. So I'd like to thank Grant for his great presentation on great production. I've learned several things during this presentation, Grant, so thank you. I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us uh, for this webinar today. I hope you got some information that will help you in your small farm endeavors, and hopefully even something uh, you can put in place yet this spring. Today's webinar has been recorded and will be found at go.illinois.edu slash sfww2022 YouTube. This link has been shared in, in all the emails uh, to you this week and was placed in the chat box. We hope uh, to have today's recording on that playlist by uh, tomorrow afternoon. So uh, thank you everybody and, and I hope everyone has a, uh, a great growing season and a great rest of the, your day today.